We'll be seeing how to determine the shear demand for flexible diaphragms. We'll be doing this through an example. What we're showing here is uh, one diaphragm. 120 kips is the diaphragm design force, which is probably not the same as the seismic design force for the lateral system. We have four lines of resistance, A, B, C, and D. There's a small 10 foot by 10 foot opening here adjacent to line B. The main task here is to consider the diaphragm to be a simply supported beam between lines of resistance. So let's draw those in first. So lines D and C, we're looking at this segment right here. We'll assume that the diaphragm is a simply supported beam between those two lines. We'll look alternately at a distributed load, W1, or at a resultant acting at the center, R1. Same thing for the other beam. So here we have the center one, lines C and B. We have a distributed load, we'll call it W2, and a resultant, R2. Because there's two different segments in this last beam, it'll look a little bit more complicated. But now our distributed load is going to change values. W3 over on this side, W4 over on this side, and we'll also have resultants R3 and R4. These links correspond to the links of the diaphragm, 30 feet, 15 feet here, and 10 feet and 20 feet right here. Once we have it in this way, it's simply a matter of statics. We'll go through it all, but none of what we're doing at this point is anything new. To calculate the loads, we'll distribute the force of 120 kips proportional to the areas, so we need to know the areas. We'll call the areas here A1, A2, A3, and A4. Don't get confused between the walls at lines A1 and A2. So A1, 30 feet by 30 feet, 900 square feet. A2, 15 feet by 20 feet. 300 square feet, A3 10 feet by 20 feet, 200 square feet, and A4 20 feet by 30 feet, 600 square feet. The total, if you add these up, is 2,000 square feet. Once we have that, we can calculate the values of the resultants. R1 is going to be the value of the corresponding area divided by the total times the shear for the whole diaphragm, we get from this 54 kips. R2 similarly is going to be its area divided by the total times 120 kips, and we're going to get for that 18 kips. On this last one, we'll have to look at two different areas. R3 is going to be its corresponding area divided by the, the total, times 120 kips, we get 12 kips here. And R4 is going to be its corresponding area, divided by the total, times 120 kips is equal to 36 kips. We can check this by noting that these four resultants indeed add up to 120 kips. We can also calculate the value of the distributed loads. So W1 is going to be the value of R1, the total force, divided by this length of the beam, or 30 feet. We can calculate this to be 1.8 kips per foot. W2 is the value of the resultant, divided by the length of the beam. And we would calculate this to be 0.9 kips per foot. I'll come over here and calculate W3, the value of the resultant, divided by the length, and we would get 
1.2 kips per foot. And lastly, W4 is going to be the value of the resultant divided by the length, and this will be 1.8 kips per foot. So let's make a mental note of these results, the values for the resultants, the values for the distributed loads. We'll now move to calculate the two simpler cases. These are these two segments between D and C and C and B. These are simply supported beams with uniform loads, very straightforward. Here I've summarized the relevant resultants, values of distributed load, and I've started sketching out free bodies of the relevant beams. I haven't finished these yet. We're interested in ultimately obtaining shear diagrams of these beams or of these segments of diaphragm. Simply support a beam, we have a reaction at each end. That reaction is half the total force, half of 54 kips is 27 kips. Similarly here, half of 18 kips is 9 kips. We can now draw a shear diagram. There we go, hand sketch, but it looks reasonable enough. Value here, 27 kips and 27. The other one's very similar, 9 and 9. These are the values of shear that we'll use to design the diaphragm. So this may be what we need. We have the shear max is equal to 27 kips, and the shear max is equal to 9 kips. Now sometimes we may be interested in the shear divided by the depth of the diaphragm. That may be a more convenient value for design. We'll indicate that with the lowercase v, 27 kips divided by these 30 feet here, and that's going to be equal to 0 0.9 kips per foot. Similarly here, lowercase v is equal to the 9 kips divided by these 20 feet right here, and we get for that 0 0.45 kips per foot. So these are the design values that we would then carry forward in the design process. We still haven't done this segment right here, and that's what we'll do next. You can see here that I've summarized our previous results for that segment, the resultants and the distributed loads, and I've also summarized our shears in absolute terms and also divided by the depth of each diaphragm segment. So a little bit more complicated, we now need to compute the end reactions. To compute this value shear at B, or the reaction at B, we're going to sum moments about this point. This moment arm is 30 feet. We're going to divide that out to the other side. And then we have R3 acting over a moment arm of 25 feet, and R4 acting over a moment arm of 10 feet. Similarly, to get this value here, we'll sum moments about B. Again, we'll divide out that moment arm of 30 feet. R3 now acts over 5 feet. R4 now has a moment arm of 20 feet. We have all the necessary values, R3, R4. We can plug in and we would find that the value for shear at B is 22 kips and the value for shear at A is 26 kips. To draw a shear diagram, of course, we need the actual distributed load with values W3 here and W4 here that are given over on this side. And here we can put 22 kips and 26 kips. The relevant lengths are 10 feet and 20 feet. Let's draw in our shear diagram. This is going to be a little bit smaller on the left side than the right side. 
coming down from 22 kips with a value of 1.2 kips per foot times a length of 10 feet. That's 12 kips, 22 kips minus 12 kips. We're going to come down to 10 kips right here. We can draw in the rest of our diagram. And so we have the maximum shear at B is equal to 22 kips. The maximum shear at A is equal to 26 kips. The reason that I split it out is that we have different depths. Over this left-hand segment, the depth is 20 feet. Over this right-hand segment, the depth is 30 feet. So per unit depth, these are actually going to be different. At B, we're dividing by 20 feet. So 22 kips divided by 20 feet gives us 1.1 kips per foot. The maximum shear per unit depth at A, now we're dividing by 30 feet, is going to yield us 0 0.87 kips per foot. And now we have all the relevant values, either absolute shear values, shear values divided by the depth of the diaphragm, and how we proceed from here is really design choice. Do we have the same exact diaphragm throughout? Well, we're looking at designing for 1.1 kips per foot of depth. A flexible diaphragm is very likely a wood diaphragm. And thinking in terms of shear per foot of depth is entirely appropriate for a wood diaphragm. And again, keeping the diaphragm the same throughout the entire story, again, is, is a very appropriate choice. So most realistically, this value right here is probably our governing design value. So to summarize, we calculated areas. We found the resultant on each section proportional to the area the distributed load on the same sections by taking the resultant divided by the diaphragm length. For simple sections that are only uniform loads, in other words, that are rectangular between lines of resistance, it's very simple statics. We're very familiar with it at this point, and we can find our shears at the end, divide by the diaphragm depths as appropriate. We finished with the segment that had an opening. That resulted in a more complicated loading, both in terms of the distributed load as well as the resultants. We had to do a little bit more work to get our reactions, a little bit more work to get our shear diagram. At the end of the day, though, it's still only statics, and we were able to get our values for shear divided by diaphragm depth, or just shears, if that were appropriate. In a subsequent video, we'll continue this example and we'll now look at diaphragm moments and chord forces. In a video after that, we'll look at the same example and look at collector forces.